Extend my greetings to the Napa Institute participants in this virtual conference. I'm Bob Woodson. I'm the president and founder of the Woodson Center, a not-for-profit organization located in Washington, D.C. We have low-income leaders in 39 states, about 2,500 of them, that we provide training and technical assistance and we aid them in developing solutions from within their own community of the problems of violence and, and in despair. There is a prayer that I'd like to utter before I uh, offer my remarks, and then I commend to you, and that is, Lord, give me the strength to tell and pursue the truth, especially when it's inconvenient to me. George Bernard Shaw asked the rhetorical question, must a Christ die in torment in every age to save those that lack imagination? And Einstein said that imagination is more important than knowledge. And one of my favorite sayings from Dr. King is that a mature person is able to encourage self-criticism, that that's the highest form of maturity. And so it's important for us as individuals and groups to be willing to uh, challenge ourselves in the way we are thinking about issues and, and therefore our actions in pursuit of those interests. And so I would like to discuss with you for the next 20 minutes or so uh, my reflections on the crisis that America is facing uh, with the race, the tribalism, the rampant violence that we're witnessing all over this nation, there are solutions, there are remedies. And so before I conclude, I'd like to offer what the Woodson Center in 1776 is doing to offer at least a road uh, forward that will produce, I think, outcomes that will reunite America and bring us together. But to give you a little context from what uh, I'm about to uh, address, I want to just tell you two stories that helps perhaps understand a perspective that we should bring to understanding. And that is that our strategic situation and our response should be determined by our strategic circumstance. To make the point, there was a story about an old farmer who was taking his mule to market. And he got to this stream and the stream was about three feet high rushing along at about 20 miles an hour. And he forced the mule in, and the two of them were swept a mile down the river. And then he finally got across. A year passed. The farmer came to the same crossing. This time, the stream was six inches and just trickling along. And he tried to get that mule to go across, and the mule refused, because the mule is a lot like some of us. We, he had good memory, but poor judgment. And so it is important to understand that when your circumstance change, your reaction to it. As a civil rights activist in the 60s, I believed in central government intervention in state affairs because blacks did not have the vote. Segregation was the rule of law. And therefore we needed central government coming in with armed men, with bayonets on their rifles to ensure that the states abide by the law and integrate. And so I believe in central government intervention. If it were not for the courts, the Supreme Court offering its injunctions, we would not have had the civil rights laws passed. So and during the time of the 60s, as a conservative, I was supportive of government intervention. But now, I am against inter that same intervention because the laws have changed, circumstances have improved dramatically on issues of race, and therefore, since the, my strategic circumstances change, my strategic position should change. But a lot of people who approach the issue of race in America act as, like that mule, as if conditions have not changed and improved, and therefore they continue to to uh, look, at, look upon America as if it's been unchanged on issues of race. The second uh, uh, perspective I'd like to offer is the attitude of the person about uh, external challenges. 
Again, there was a story of a man who had two sons, and he was a drunk, he was abusive to them, and the two of them grew up. One of them became exactly like his father. He was abusive, a drunk, abusive to his family. The other one was not. He was a kind, caring father, loving father, who went on to establish a business, and he prospered. And when these two men were interviewed as to the cause of their life's trajectory, both of them gave the same uh, answer as to why and how they pursued the life that they did. Each said, it was my father. So the point of that, that story is that oppression or disadvantage or challenges in our life never is the sole determiner as to what kind of life we will pursue. It is also true with black America. 1619 Project, as you all heard about, tries to act as if the, the challenges that black Americans face today of out of wedlock birth, 70% of children being born out of wedlock births, the violence where more blacks are killed by other blacks today than were killed in the 50 years of the Klan. The people on the left are trying to convince America that the problems facing inner city blacks today are a consequence of the legacy of slavery and discrimination. And therefore, they have written a series of essays that uh, proclaim that America's birthday should be 1619, not 1776. And they also conclude in these essays that America is uh, is, is defined by racism and its existence, are to be forever cursed, and white America are villains uh, to be punished, and blacks are victims to be compensated. And so it is that perspective that d damns America and defines it almost as a criminal organization, saying that racism and injustice is enshrined in our DNA. When something's in your DNA, it means it can't be changed. And this is a cynical, self-destructive attitude that the left is, is pursuing in this country and spreading around, and it's taking hold. With the death of George Floyd, um, it is made conditions where the left has exploited that racial past of ours and trying to define America by its racial past and trying to undermine all of its civic institutions. And so what we are, are doing at the Woodson Center and in 1776, since they are using the issue of race as a bludgeon to undermine the, the integrity and, 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 and attitude towards our nation, we are confronting it directly by offering not a, a, another, an alternative debate but we have assembled black scholars and activists to challenge 1776. We believe that the real birthday of America is 1776, not 1619. That America should be never defined by its birth defect of slavery. I agree with 1619 that the issue of slavery needs to be revealed with all of its horrors and its brutality. We, we, we agree with that, and perhaps that story has not been completely revealed and told. So we agree with that, but we disagree that America should be defined by that uh, birth defect of slavery, but America should be defined by the promise that it has provided. After all, we are the only nation on the face of the earth that ever fought a civil war to end slavery. It is the reason, and, and, and so what I'd like to do is in, in, in 1776, we have uh, assembled these scholars to not only write articles and essays that directly refutes the positions taken by 1619, but we are providing evidence that embrace of the values of our founders have the consequence of improving an individual's life 
and can be the foundation upon which whole low-income crime-ridden neighborhoods can and are being restored. Because if we want to convince people of our values, it's not enough to offer them a white paper that details America's exceptionalism. It is important, as the Woodson Center is doing, to present to the American public evidence that the embrace of these values have the consequence of improving the quality of one's life. For instance, we challenge 1619. They're saying that the slavery and discrimination uh, is the cause of the problems and the challenges that black America faces in these inner cities. Well, this is just not true. And so I'll give you some examples of why it is not true. Uh, in in, 60, in, in, um, in a 20 year period between 1920 and 1940, the educational gap between whites in the South and blacks was three years. It was eight years for whites and five fifth grade level for blacks. Black America responded by Julius Rosenwald, the CEO of Sears, partnered with Booker T. Washington, and together they uh, uh, provided $4.8 million to the black community in the South to build schools. The black community itself, through ch saving, uh, participated and raised funds and matched it with $4.6 million of their own. And over the course of those years, they built 5,000 schools for rural blacks to attend school. And they were operating on budgets that were half those of white schools. But as a consequence, the education gap between 1920 and 1940 closed within six months because of the existence of these Rosenwald schools. When racism was enshrined in law between 1930 and 1940, when the unemployment rate for all America was 25%, the unemployment rate for blacks was 40%. When racism was enshrined in law, blacks had no political participation in, our, in government. Yet our Christian faith and the strength of a nuclear family served as a shield against decline. And so that the marriage rate in the black community was higher than any group in the country. Elderly people could walk safely in their communities without fear of being assaulted by their grandchildren. We had in the turn of the century in 1920, there were five black high schools in Atlanta, Dunbar High School, in Atlanta, Booker T. Washington in Atlanta, Dunbar High School in uh, Washington, D.C. And in these high schools, the class sizes were about 50. They were limited to used textbooks. The budgets were half those spent on white schools. This is in 1920. Even in the presence of those limitations and those challenges, those five black high schools in 1920 tested higher than any white school existing in those same cities. So black America demonstrated that our, our, our lot in life was never determined by the external circumstances of oppression and discrimination, that this is what 1619 Projects is, is, is making the point and so the, the, the challenge is for, for you and for America is to ask a very troubling question, that if blacks could succeed under circumstances of segregation, when we were spending less on black education in those times, why in the past 50 years, when our blacks in urban centers all over this nation, why they are failing in systems, school systems, social service systems, being run by their own people. In fact, as a veteran of the civil rights movement, the goal of that movement was to elect black officials to run the city councils, the school boards, the police departments, the courts. And we said, elect us, and we will demonstrate how 
the people in those cities would prosper and they would benefit from having black leadership. Well, that black leadership has been in place that every major city where we have these uh, inequities, they have been run by liberal, liberal democratic mayors. This is not a political statement. But the question is, if the goal of the civil rights movement was to transfer political power, the, the promise and, and the, it was that it would produce superior outcomes for the least of God's children living in those cities. So they have not produced. We have spent about $22 trillion in the last 60 years on programs to uplift the poor in these cities. And this money has been controlled by officials in those cities. And yet we are told today that conditions are worse than they were prior to the 1960s. And I think what, is, what the response is from the left, rather than ask the very troubling questions as to why low-income blacks are failing in systems run by their own people when they prospered almost more and, and under discrimination in segregation, in order to avoid having to seriously address this question, they point to institutional racism, whatever that means. I'm not so sure what that means. Systemic racism. I don't know what that means either. And so what we believe, 1776, what we're doing is challenging this, this paradigm of theirs, this proposition that it is that the cause of the inner city uh, disintegration that is occurring, the violence, the out of wedlock births, is related to slavery or discrimination. So what 1776 is doing is that we are providing essays that provides an alternative narrative, not a, de a, a debate, but a determining narrative, an alternative narrative to address that and answer that question. And what we're doing in our essays is we're going back into the history of black America and try to discover the resilience, how a, a black America was able to advance and achieve in the, in the presence of oppression to give us some knowledge and insight as to how we can borrow some of those examples from the past and apply them in the present. For example, when blacks were denied access to hotels, we built our own, financed out of our church's built of funds. In, in, in New York, we had the St. Teresa Hotel. In Chicago, the St. Charles. In Miami, the Carver and the Calvert Hotel. In Atlanta, the Wallahaji. I could go on and on. We built vaudeville theaters with orchestra pits in the cities of Philadelphia. In the city of Chicago, the scene of violence and, and dis, dis, dismay. In 1929, there were 731 black-owned businesses. There were also $100 million in real estate assets owned by blacks at a time when we were being redlined. And every city had its own black Wall Street. And the Greenwood section of Tulsa, Oklahoma, for example, that burned down in 1920 because they were the envied by Tulsa. There were five men that had owned private planes in 1920, living in that thriving Wall Street. Remember, this is just 60 years after slavery. We were able to prosper. And so what 1776 is doing, we are, are, are writing essays that celebrates Blacks, how we survived and thrived in the presence of oppression. And we are looking for contemporary examples of that spirit of self-determination existed back then. And we believe if we were able to survive and thrive in the presence of those challenges, then we can do the same thing today. And so, but we are supporting grassroots leaders who are also reviving and revitalizing these, these centers so that we can demonstrate that solutions to the problems facing America today, 
There are two things we must do, and we invite you to join us at 1776 and at the Woodson Center. We invite you to join us because it is important for America to, to, to build on its strength, to avoid the kind of disaster that, warned, that we were warned by Samuel Adams. Samuel Adams said in 1779 that a general dissolution of principles and manners will surely overthrow the liberties of America than the whole force of a common enemy. While the people are virtuous, they cannot be subdued, but when they lose their virtue, they will be ready to surrender their liberties to the first external or internal invader. For if virtue and knowledge are diffused among the people, they will never be enslaved, and this will be their great security. Neither the wisest constitution nor the wisest laws will secure the liberty and happiness of a people whose manners are universally corrupt. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a cultural challenge today, and it is important for America in order for us to survive, that we must revive the virtues of our founders and the grassroots leaders, and we at the Woodson Center in 1776, we are mobilizing Americans across racial and across class lines to come together and the tribalism. We need to deracialize race and desegregate poverty. And we are going into low income neighborhoods. We are amassing a movement to push back and celebrate America's exceptionalism. And, and we're only going to do this by providing the support in our inner cities that demonstrates that America can be restored if we were able to survive and thrive under circumstances of slavery and discrimination, then we, we can do so today. America's best days are in front of us, but we can only do this as we come together. The model for that cooperation is enshrined in a book that I wrote called The Triumphs of Joseph. Joseph, as you know, was one of 13 children sold into slavery by his brothers, and, and he, and, but he faithfully served in the house of Potiphar, falsely accused of attempted rape of his wife, imprisoned for many, many years. And at age 31, Joseph found himself in the prison. Pharaoh had dreams that none of his experts could solve. And he, they called upon Joseph. But if Joseph had defined himself by bitterness because he was treated unjustly, we wouldn't know about him. But Joseph refused to become a victim, and he was faithful to his God even in the presence of injustice that was visited upon him. And Pharaoh called him forward, and Joseph told him there'll be seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine, save up 20%, and appoint an overseer. And Pharaoh appointed Joseph. It meant that and what we need today are the good pharaohs, like some of you, coming together with our Josephs in 1776 at the Woodson Center. Because our Joseph, if, if, we wouldn't, if there was not a good pharaoh, we wouldn't know about Joseph. Good pharaohs are people with power and influence that have the capacity and the ability and willingness to look beyond the power of their influence and see over the horizon troubles that are coming and reach across racial and class lines to empower partners who can join together, both from the streets and the suites, and help to reclaim and redefine America from, and learn from its troubled past strategies to rebuild this nation from the inside out and the bottom up. And that's our challenge. And we invite you to join the Woodson Center, to join 1776, and to rebuild our nation, come together with the Josephs and the Pharaohs.